this is definitely the year to get the reviews up on my channel for all this stuff between uh, the X-Men 97 TV series and Deadpool coming out in the summer. So I decided to start with a second look with X-Men, the original film from 2000. The one that started it all. Actually, the one that didn't start it all because X-Men is a comic book that actually started it. And then uh, there was actually the Fox animated series that was amazing. Uh, back in way better than we de deserved as kids, which is what X-Men 97 is trying to recreate and pick up from where where that series kind of left off ran for five seasons. It's actually available on Disney+. Plus. It doesn't have audio description. Neither does this. I don't know what, I don't know what's up with Disney. I don't know why... You've had Fox properties long enough now that, listen, you should be making audio description for the things that make sense. This is a Marvel product now that you own. Where is the audio description for this franchise? <laughs> um, if I continue to click on Fox properties that are Marvel and they don't have audio description and you own them now... These are not things that are licensed. These are not like you're holding a Sony film temporarily. Um, you, this is yours. You own this. Why is there no accessibility on this film? Anyway, luckily I've seen X-Men just uh, an inordinate amount of times. I'm such a huge fan of X-Men as a kid. Um, God, I, I had comic books. I had trading cards we, we, i came from a generation where we had trading cards that were not just baseball cards but you could get trading cards for anything and no you didn't play cool games with them either i'm talking like pre-magic the gathering pokemon i'm talking about literally just having cards with characters on them and then trying to have um you know they'd have like different images and different uh costumes and stuff for some of the characters like I have I think I still have like a binder full of them actually somewhere um so yeah when this came out I was super excited I was working in movie theaters and I saw this a bunch of times we got these really cool and we got them for um x2 as well um we got some pretty cool little um uh promotional buttons for it the X2 ones were a lot cooler. They were all character ones. And I definitely, absolutely took one for every single character. And I had everyone. Like, I every character that had a button, I had the entire collection. I don't know where they are, but I have a full collection of the X2 promotional buttons <laughs> for every character. Um, here, uh, it's funny because I think the X-Men films have gotten a lot better but they never would have gotten there had brian singer not made this film i said brian singer oh no oh god oh no oh good okay i'm still here all right well i just uh, i'm sure the 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 algorithm of youtube will catch me <laughs> will catch up to me i've said a i've said the name of a canceled performer i'm so sorry i didn't mean i didn't mean to but he did direct this, and um, you can't change that. You can't go back later on and assign a new director to this film. And if you're avoiding X-Men because he directed it, dude, like, what about everyone else who works on the film? That's my question always, like, when people are like, oh, I don't watch it because it's got so-and-so. You do realize that, uh, like, there are all of these other people who worked in crafts uh, like down the line, there are all these other actors. Uh, sometimes it's the director also, um, who is not canceled. In this case, it is the director. There are all these other people, and like they all participated in making sure that this film like clicks and works uh, and slaps and all that good stuff. So when you don't watch it because of one thing, it's just it's very kind of offensive. <laughs> actually in many ways because it, it demeans the work of everyone else um so continue to watch and don't support uh the one person but support everybody else anyway moving on x-men uh i've seen this way too many times uh and the more times i see it I'm, I'm beginning to scrutinize it more and the fact that there is no audio description here i can't really say like if you're blind and have never 
jumped into the X-Men films that this is the film for it. The thing about mutant powers is you have to be able to see a lot of them. Uh, you need to be able to see the costumes, you need to be able to see these characters and what they're doing. Um, you need to be able to see what happens to Bruce Davidson, Senator Kelly, uh, because that's there's this whole thing about where they take a human and they sort of inject this um, DNA changing thing to make him a mutant that does or does not work very well. Um, yeah, you have to be able to see these things. There are parts of this, though, that I look back on years later, and I think to myself, huh, that's, this is interesting. I've spent way too much time with this film. Do you realize that when Wolverine shows up, and he comes in, and, and um, he's given a tour, and Professor X, is, he's got these students, right? And he's got, a, he's got students in a class, and, he, and Logan just kind of interrupts, and, and he's like, oh, that's it for today. And he gives Logan the speech, and then he talks to him about the uh, and he gives like basically a ton of exposition, which includes the whole thing about like, but on the lower levels we have for the X Men, he has three X Men. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's actually stopped to think about that, but he has Cyclops, Jean, and Storm. That's it. His recruitment is really low, or his trust in having somebody be an X Men is really low. Um, Originally, in the original comics, uh, you know, when you go all the way back, or if you uh, read the graphic novel X-Men Children of the Atom, you'll see uh, his original X-Men were Cyclops, Jean, um, Beast, Iceman, and Angel. So uh, he's missing three of his original, well, he's, he's totally missing two of his original X-Men. Iceman is wandering around as a student, and he has Cyclops and Jean. So, and then he added Storm, which is fine. Storm's a really popular character. She just didn't come around until a lot later. But if they didn't have Storm, this would be a completely all-white cast because there's no imagination here in terms of trying to um, do anything with anybody. Uh, everybody's just, just an all-white cast. <laughs> and then Halle, Halle Berry. It was 2000, so what were you expecting? Of, co of course, tokenism. Um, so, but why are there no other X-Men? <laughs> like, why, why did they stop at three? It's, it's a restraint that um, you can respect in not having too many characters and having... That he's uh, basically up against the Brotherhood, led by Magneto, who has relatively the same amount of people on his side, because he has Mystique, uh, he has Toad, and he has Sabretooth um, on his team. So basically the Brotherhood is, is the same, uh, and then they just come along and they have uh, Logan shows up with Rogue, and... Uh, they kind of, I guess that's sort of how they grow a little bit. Although Rogue is definitely not an X-Men. She ends up like hanging out with students, including Iceman, um, who is played here by Sean Ashmore, who will go on to play and have a stronger role in X2. They didn't have to recast him, which was good. And so Anna Paquin plays Rogue, who is this girl who finds out that she's got this power and she's on the run and there's this whole, like, mutant hate thing that's going on. Um, a mutant registration act. We have to make sure we know where the mutants are and, and what their powers are, what they can do, um, that Senator Kelly's pushing for. And, of course, the, the, the dynamic between uh, Charles, who believes in sort of a peaceful resolution to everything and that by showing them the best of the mutants that we can show people who we are. And Magneto believes that uh, that, that will, Eric, Eric Lyncher <laughs> believes that that will never change. And the, the hint there is that, um, you learn that, of course, Eric grew up, uh, during the, uh, during Nazi Germany. Uh, there's a scene towards the beginning with his character. So it gives actually quite a bit of backstory specifically for his character to let you know maybe there's a certain reason why he thinks this way and he's against sort of the registration act and um it really allows you actually to sympathize quite a bit with magneto 
in his side of things, which is good because uh, at this point, Brian Singer doesn't know where the X-Men franchise is headed. And because Magneto at some points is a good guy, it's good to have him be relatable and not just the world's worst villain uh, and be somebody who could change size and you can understand where he's coming from. So, um, cause in a long-term plan, he might have, Brian might've gotten to a film where, uh, Magneto was leading the X-Men, uh, in place of Charles, like he does later in the series. And like he does, I believe in X-Men 97. So, um, all of this is, is stuff that, you know, I've, I've seen and, and think about and, and I think about what I miss now being a blind person watching this film and the fact that it doesn't have audio description and just like, what would I tell somebody? Um, I think, uh, there are, there, there are different groups of people. There are the people who have no knowledge of the X-Men at all, who know nothing, um, and would be starting into this cold who just don't read or follow comic books. I know that seems weird, but those people exist. They, you know, I don't know that they'd be interested in jumping into something like X-Men, um, but there would be a lot of explaining to do because there's no audio description here. So I'd have to sit down with somebody and be like, well, okay, so uh, let's start at the top and just work my way down through the characters and explain their power set, explain what they look like. Um, I remember what they look like and I know what their power set looks like just, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that I'm also a huge fan of the series. So I know what a lot of characters look like, even though they're not really featured in, uh, films or t TV shows, or they've been lightly featured in films or TV shows, uh, characters like, uh, the blob, for example, who is briefly featured in X-Men Origins Wolverine for like five seconds, uh, I get his character design and, um, but you know, uh, he, I also can be disappointed with the way he was portrayed in film. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, in this film, everybody basically looks like they, uh, like they should. So it's, it's fine in the comic books. I thought this was great casting back in the day. Um, Ray Park, actually, as Toad is really interesting because he, since uh, this Toad doesn't really talk, um, he it, he has a lot of physicality. Ray Park was really good at um, being sort of that, one of those actors who uh, is really also a stunt actor. So he can do a lot of Toad's stuff really well. Um, and Halle Berry is... A Fantastica Storm. I know they wanted to do an X-Men Origins Storm as well as an X-Men Origins Magneto, but they got scared because X-Men Origins Wolverine wasn't any good. <laughs> so they canceled those two projects. Um, and it, it's... It, but, you know, uh, how do you... How do you explain Mystique, right? Okay, so she's... She can change... She can shapeshift, but her... Her default is this blue, um, scaly blue version. Uh, I believe they, I believe she has yellow eyes in this too. I think um, her eyes are, I can't remember her eye color. That's now, that's weird now. Anyway, um, I believe she has yellow eyes. Anyway, um, she has her own character design that is very unique and, and Rebecca Romaine had to sit through a lot of makeup to make that work. Without audio description, you wouldn't know any of that. Um, you wouldn't get Sabretooth's character design at all. Um, you probably don't know that Cyclops is walking around wearing glasses the whole time that are uh, tinted with a very specific red, uh, whether they are his uh, sort of fighting goggles or whether or not they are shades, like more typical shades. He always has this like ruby quartz lens to them that supposedly helps block out so he can keep his eyes open without blasting people with his lasers because his lasers are always on he can't control them um and um yeah so there's a, a scene actually where he has to keep his eyes closed um because if he opens them 
um, he'll blast Jean. And uh, anyway, yeah, yeah uh, I've seen this um, a bunch of times. <laughs> and um, it's uh, it just needs audio description on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I wanted to start at the top with X-Men, and so I did. I had to, to start here so that I can get to the others. I'm hoping they don't all not have audio description. I'm hoping we get to audio description at some point. I know this is X-Men from 2000, so it was the X-Men film that always had the least amount of possibility of having audio description. Um, but I'm hoping later on down the line, my God, if I watch this entire franchise on Disney Plus and there's no audio description, like, what are we doing, Disney? What are we doing? You're just going to get a whole bunch of reviews of me going, damn you, for like all the way through. Um, especially in a year where you're celebrating the X-Men by releasing X-Men 97, uh, and you've got Deadpool versus, uh, Deadpool and Wolverine coming up, not versus, they're together. Anyway, um, yeah, what are we doing here? So, uh, this is my, my hot take on X-Men, a film that I love, um, and, uh, a film that, looking at, looking back on it, the only reason that I grade it the way that I grade it is because I also know uh, where it goes. And I believe X2 is a better film. I believe this franchise actually does grow. And I believe there are better films later on in the franchise, too. So while I think X-Men is a strong start, um, I think there are places to go. Um, and it's interesting because I would have maybe... Uh, years ago, 20 years ago, given this like an A minus, but uh, today, nowadays, I'm actually going X Men A B plus because I know that there are even more levels to this franchise as you go throughout time, and that's as a fan you have to learn how to sort of separate yourself from the material so that you can grade it. It still is something that I really enjoy, um, but it's also something that. I know that there are later things that come down the pike that give me a better range. There are also worse X-Men films than this. So this is still really high for me. But it is kind of funny that there are only three X-Men at the top of the film. It's kind of hilarious. Uh, unless we're counting Professor X, which we shouldn't. Um, he's not really combat ready, but... Um, anyway, so... <laughs> He doesn't really train the same way that the other three do in the danger room. Um, so he's sort of like a spiritual leader of the X-Men. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so... Um, maybe one additional X-Men would have made this a little less weird? I don't know. Anyway, just some thoughts that I have. Um, so, uh, but my honest-to-God re reaction to this also is that it's unwatchable. Um, I can grade it because I've seen it, uh, uh, I don't even know, 15 times. I, when it was the only X-Men film, it was the only thing I could watch before there was X2, I watched it a lot. So I got like a whole bunch of, of viewings like right up front. Like I saw it a couple times while it was in theaters because it, it was in the theater that I worked at. So I could just literally just walk in and just walk, watch X-Men. And I could, while I was like on break, watch parts of X-Men. So I, I don't know how much I've actually seen this film, but a lot. <laughs> Just a lot. Um, but yeah, I realized that without audio description, it's unwatchable. So, um, especially if you've never seen it before. Um, I just have seen it way too many times. <laughs> so this is sort of like, my ultimate is uh, Jurassic Park, which is, I, I don't actually know how many times I've seen that film, about 30, 50. I wouldn't, if... If an angel came down from heaven and told me, you've seen that film 83 times, I'd be like, that feel the, the tracks. That doesn't surprise me. Um, so uh, when, when you've done one film so many times, you're just like, I I mean, I know all the lines. I remember the shots in the film. And there were shots in here that I remembered. I remember what they looked like. Those shots were still ingrained in my brain. So um, it benefited this, this viewing without audio description, even though I can't see the film at all. There were scenes, like, I remembered what uh, Senator Kelly looked like coming out of the water. That's a weird thing to remember. <laughs> you know, that was a weird scene to remember. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, 
that's it. So thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Uh, please click that subscribe button so I can continue to talk about audio description in front of the largest audience I possibly can so that we can get audio description on films like X-Men. I have a website, MacMovieGuy.com. You can go to x or Instagram and follow me at MacMovieGuy. You can go to the audio description project, adp.acb.org. It'll let you know what has audio description and where you can watch it. And you can go to the admin.org. That's the adna.org. It'll let you know who's narrating your favorite films and television series. That's it for me today. I will watch something else and see you guys on the other side.